Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. My name is David Nunez. I am the head of school here at Great River. I use he, him pronouns, and uh, I'm really excited to share you know, this school and this program with you all tonight. I'm also going to have uh, the other two staff members who are here tonight come and introduce themselves. So come on up. Karen, first. Hi, my name is Karen Anway, and I'm the Interim Elementary Program Director, so I'm the person you would go to with any questions about overall, you know, questions about the program, um, or how things work. Um, I'm also the Enrollment Coordinator, so you'll hear from me in that context as well. I am Stacey Krieger, I use she, her pronouns. I've been at Great River for 10 years, and my role is I'm the Director of Administration, so I'm on the leadership team, um, and know a lot about a lot of things in the school, a lot of logistics. I might, I will be having them come up and do portions of the presentation tonight, but i um, going to start off um, just by sharing the Great River mission. So Great River School, a Montessori learning community, prepares students for their unique roles as responsible and engaged citizens of the world. To start us off, though, I wanted to give you all uh, a little bit of vocabulary as far as our school goes, because we may be using certain terms tonight, and I want to make sure we're all on the same page and understanding each other. Um, so first of all, we are a Montessori school, and that means that we uh, work with and follow the teachings of Maria Montessori. She was a doctor, she was a scientist, um, and she did, uh, for many, many years, observations and observations and thousands of hours of observations of children and wrote a lot about human development, in particular um, for younger ages. And then we also, she did write a little bit about adolescent ages, and so we also use her teachings when it comes to our adolescent students. Um, guide is a term we use instead of teacher. Uh, I might say teacher just to make sure we're all on the same page tonight, but we do use the term guide here at Great River. Um, and the idea, um, the little sing-songy phrase is that we are guides on the sides as opposed to sages on the stage. And I'll get to what that means and, and what that's a reference to later in the evening. Uh, international Baccalaureate, there might be a reference to that. We are also an International Baccalaureate school. That is mostly in the 11th and 12th grade that we do international baccalaureate classes. It's a program, it's an international globalized program of education. Um, and uh, you could take a course, an IB course here or in another state or in even in another country and potentially have the same curriculum. Now the reason why we find that that makes sense with Montessori in a lot of ways is that we feel like Montessori is how we teach and IB curriculum in the 11th and 12th grade is what we teach. So there's still, they, they mesh together nicely and they fit together nicely. There are aspects of the IB program that filter down to, especially down into like the seventh grade. There's a program called CAS, that's an IB program that runs through the seventh grade. So it is a big piece of what we do in general. Uh, lastly, you'll hear me refer to these four different age group levels across the school, lower elementary, upper elementary, lower adolescent, and upper adolescent. These are the four groups that students are put into or grouped into um, over their time at Great River. So lower elementary is first through third grade, upper elementary is fourth through sixth grade, lower adolescent is seventh through tenth grade, uh, through ninth grade, and tenth through twelfth grade is upper adolescent. Um, we do have in both lower elementary and upper elementary, we're going to talk a little bit later about what a, a day looks like for students so they get a sense and so you get a sense of what, what it seems like to come to Great River on any given day. Um, but in case you didn't know, our classes in the lower elementary and in the upper elementary are mixed classrooms. So in any given classroom in lower elementary, for instance, you might have first, second, and third graders in the same classroom. And uh, that fits in with the next slide. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but this is Montessori's theory of human development in, in one image, basically. Um, and so there's all sorts of things we could talk about here, but the reason why I put it up there is to say that this is why we break grades into the way we do, why we group students age-wise in the way we do, why we um, 
what types of curriculum we follow at different age levels, um, what things that we expect that students are working on and going through at different age levels, because Montessori and many people in the 100 years since Montessori have observed these things again and again and again when it comes to human development. So what do we do here that's um, different? Like I said, we're a Montessori program, so you'll get a sense of, and a little bit of what a regular day looks like. We also do, um, one thing we're known for is our key experiences, our overnight trips. So at the elementary level, we start our overnight trips with a trip to um, Eagle Ridge for third graders. It's a two-night overnight trip for third graders. And it starts to train them and teach them about uh, independence, about um, how to be interdependent with each other, how to work together, and also how to get a little distance um, from family and be okay with that and then come back to their family and have had a good positive experience. Fourth, fifth, and sixth graders go to Camp Widgewagen up north every year. Um, and it used to be we also did Wolf Ridge, but um, we're just doing Widgewagen at this point because it's such a great camp. It's such a cool place if you're familiar with it. So fourth, fifth, and sixth graders go to Widgewagen. Beyond that, our seventh and eighth graders go on an odyssey. They go on a hundred mile bike trip. Our ninth graders go on um, a farm trip out to a local farm we have a relationship with. Our 10th graders go um, to Lake Itasca. Uh, our 11th graders go on a college visit tour and our 12th graders go on a canoe trip. So getting ready for all of those trips is a big part of why we do trips at this age too. Um, the trip to Widgewagen is actually a full week long trip actually too, just so everybody knows. Um, we also do community meetings in a pretty unique way, so it starts in elementary but works its way up through all of our levels, and actually our staff as well practice our community meetings with each other in our meetings um, uh, several times a year so that we know sort of what the student experience is like and also um, practice those uh, particular skills and even down to the fact that, and this is a very unique thing for Great River, I've never been in another school, but the staff actually finishes our community meetings with a sing-along usually. Um, very unique for a school experience for a group of professionals sitting around in a circle, but we are trying to practice the skills that we teach the kids to do in their community meetings. Um, and then I also wanted to speak about something uh, that I think we focus on in a lot of ways here at Great River, and that's growth mindset academics. So again, I'm not gonna go into great detail with this chart, because there's a lot of information up there. This is based on the work of Carol Dweck. And the idea is that there is um, a perception that is pretty common in our world today, in our culture today, that we have a fixed mindset that you're born a certain way, that you have a certain intelligence, that you don't necessarily can't shift or uh, grow that intelligence over time. We try to focus on a growth mindset. So a growth mindset would believe that intelligence can be developed. And it, we believe, um, and a lot of studies have shown, that it leads to this idea that um, students have a greater desire to learn and develop and specifically when it comes to learning and criticism, that they uh, are in a place where if you have a fixed mindset, you take criticism as a personal attack. And if you have a growth mindset, you take criticism as an opportunity for growth, that mistakes are gifts and they are a chance for us to learn and grow and get better at the things, even at every age, even myself. Um, I try to model that all the time by pointing out my own mistakes. Why do students succeed here? We talk a lot about responsibility. We talk a lot about, when I talk about responsibility, um, especially as students get older and older, there's a lot of freedom in a Montessori setting. Students are given a lot of choice. Students are given a lot of opportunity to do independent study once they get to the adolescent level. And so with that freedom, there's a certain level of responsibility that students have to show that they are responsible to the adults in the room and then earn that freedom. Also, respect, interdependence is a big part of Montessori's teaching. At the actual lesson on interdependence at the elementary level is the Great River, which is where our name comes from as a school. So, um, little tidbit of knowledge that um, you guys can use at trivia. 
Um, will my child, what will my child learn? So uh, first of all, academic skills, absolutely. We are a public school and we do talk about um, everything that goes into the state standards. We do talk about, um, and I'm gonna talk in a little bit about standardized tests as well. Um, but I actually had someone ask me once um, when they sort of heard vaguely about Montessori, they came to me and they were like, well, do you teach the kids how to read in Montessori? I was like, well, of course we do teach the kids how to read. Um, and actually, we have very high reading scores and do very well at reading in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, the way Montessori classrooms are organized, they are organized in a way that creates an inter interdependence between the students that requires respect for self, others, and the environment, and that, um, has a certain level of personal responsibility in that growth mindset that I already spoke about. Um, so. All of those things are key aspects of what we're teaching our students. Uh, the focus of the curriculum, meaningful work, freely chosen, requiring collaboration. That's Montessori in a phrase. So um, it's hands-on. We use Montessori materials, which you'll see later tonight if you have the opportunity. Uh, at the end of our talk, we're going to open up a couple classrooms so you can check out what the Montessori materials in the classrooms look like. Um, and uh, students work on individual work plans, and then as I said, at the 11th and 12th grade level, we have that IB curriculum um, specifically that um, is a very um, rigorous cur curriculum. You will learn more about that. Um, if you were to come to the adolescent night, we go into great detail about each course you take and all of that sort of stuff. But if you have questions about the IB curriculum, you can also ask after tonight's presentation, and I'll be happy to answer those questions. So, school demographics, um, to be totally blunt and transparent, it is asked, certainly asked of us at times, why is such a white population at Great River? And so we want to be really transparent about that because we don't want to be part of a segregated school system. So if you were to look at the demographics of uh, St. Paul Public Schools, demographics of St. Paul as a city, and the demographics of Great River, one thing you will notice right away is that that blue section um, that is the white population of St. Paul Public Schools at about 21% is very different than our 74% of students who are white here at Great River. Now, actively we are trying to diversify our student population um, and we, it's actually part of our strategic plan here at Great River to diversify the students and diversify the staff and also we, have, we are bound by the lottery system here at Great River, and so the students that apply to Great River are the students that are in the lottery system and therefore get into Great River. There is nothing about Great River that prioritizes or legally can we prioritize by demographics in any sort of way. So what we are attempting to do to diversify our student population is to try to spread the word and to build knowledge about Great River in different communities that will um, diversify the number of students and the type of students who are actually putting applications into Great River. So I can speak more about that if you're interested in it too. We also talk very directly at Great River about race, racism, institutional oppression. It's built into our curriculum. It is conversations that we have here at Great River. We take it very seriously and we're going to be continuing to take it seriously and do that work as a school. Total shift, uh, school transportation. Stacy's gonna speak a little bit about school transportation, some of the logistics of coming to Great River. All right, I think this is on a later slide too, but school starts at nine o'clock, and we are done at 3.50, and part of that is so we could keep our busing. At the beginning of this year, we had to shift our day, school day back a half hour um, so that the buses would run for us. So busing is an ongoing challenge for us. We do provide yellow school buses for elementary students, um, they get the priority. Adolescent students can ride it as well if there's room. Uh, we have four bus routes, and you can look them up on our website, on our transportation page. There's a map that shows where those routes run. We are required um, as a public school in the state of Minnesota to serve the students that live within St. Paul, um, and that's the border of our transportation policy. However, we have extended that border a little bit into Minneapolis because we have a lot of families who live in Minneapolis. That being said, when we have four bus routes and you know a lot of people who ride the bus, we can't go all the way into Minneapolis. We just cannot, um, we can't fill more buses the deeper we go uh, and financially we just cannot do it. 
That being said, if you live in St. Paul and you don't live two miles from a bus stop already, you could request a stop. If you're outside of St. Paul, we would not be able to add stops for you. Just so you know, that's how it works. Um, we are we work with a bus company. It's if you know people who work at who live have been at Great River and use our busing, it's not always great. Um, but there's also a lot of problems in transportation in the cities and in the state in general. Um, it's really hard for them to find drivers. It's very hard for like any school really to have good transportation. Um, and other companies and businesses or other like transportation companies are like, oh, you're only four buses, they don't wanna work with us. So we struggle with transportation, we do our best and we try to make sure that students who need, to get, need a ride to get to school have a way to get to school. We also provide a carpool list of anybody who's interested in carpooling. We'll add you to a map and share that with those families who are interested and you can find people in your neighborhood who live near you and arrange carpools. I'd say a lot of our students also bike to school, even in the winter, and many students who live in the neighborhood can walk to school. For older students, for adolescents, we have Metro Transit passes that are, they are given for free. There's a 3B bus that comes right outside of our school and stops literally just across the street. So many students use that once they get into the older grades to get to and from school. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Stacy is also the transportation coordinator of the school. I don't know if you said that, but uh, knows so much more about transportation and the busing system than I do that I always have her come up and speak to that. Um, the nutrition program here at Great River is very unique in a lot of ways, and it is also under some pretty drastic and huge changes right now, so I just wanted to be transparent about that. We have a fully functioning kitchen on site. We prepare from scratch food every day and hot meals, oh, this should have been updated, hot meals five days a week actually right now. Um, locally sourced when possible, grown on site when possible. We have a small urban farm where the students work to grow vegetables and grow um, uh, and raise animals. We have chickens and goats here at Great River, although the goats are not here right now, so you can't go visit them, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, we have culinary arts courses here at Great River where the kids work in the kitchen and learn about cooking and learn about nutrition, uh, learn about chemistry, learn about math. Um, we have microeconomics courses where students are learning about where students are learning about um, uh, how to create things and sell them and, and basically Montessori referred to it as the store. It's this opportunity for uh, students to learn about how economics works firsthand. Um, and then we also support all students that qualify for free and reduced lunch with free and reduced lunch, and we have for quite a while. Now what's changing about Great River is that um, you're probably familiar with the fact that the governor set, uh, created a law last year, so that, uh, or not a law, but an opportunity um, in many ways for all students in the state of Minnesota to eat for free. That's all students that go to a school that participates in a national school lunch program. And we haven't, for many years, participated in a national school lunch program. So we didn't have a way to actually get that reimbursement for students this year. But because it is an equity issue, because we feel strongly about it, we decided to move forward with actually applying for a national school lunch program that should be in place by the fall. And that means that all students at Great River who want to eat will eat for free. However, it also means some changes to the nutritional program. We decided not to use the National School Lunch Program previously because of some of the restrictions, some of the bureaucracy, some of the data entry, some of the uh, uh, requirements of the program that didn't quite align with the um, cost of the high quality food that we were producing here and the amount that we were getting reimbursed. So, Anyway, we are changing the program, we are changing it so that students can eat for free, and we are doing our absolute best to try to retain the things that make the nutrition program really unique and really cool here at Great River. So we are working on our best, we are doing our best to do that, and it is going to be looking different a little bit next year, and in some ways we're not even sure yet. So, um, a typical day here at Great River. I'm going to have Karen come and talk about a typical day at the elementary level in, in particular. Yeah, so students come in in the morning and they're greeted at the door and go to their classrooms. And then um, what we have in the morning is a three-hour work period, which is a concept traditional to Montessori, with the idea that that is the time when students will be called to lessons with their teacher. It's the time when the core curriculum is to delivered to students. 
But a lot of that time is spent independently working, and it helps build student independence, planning abilities, follow-through abilities. It involves a lot of work on the teacher's part in following up with students and conferencing with them and saying, you know, are you working on this work? And, you know, they'll set due dates or they'll be checking the work that the students are doing. Um, and the idea, another idea behind it is that if you have a longer period of time that is not interrupted, that students feel that they can commit to bigger work and really delve into the really exciting projects that I feel like were my favorite part of being a Montessori teacher when the students would say, you know, well, we're going to make a map of the world and put on all the cities that are mentioned in this book, or we're going to, you know, um, create a medieval village and then suits of armor and costumes, and, you know, they just get so into their interests. Um, and that's the beautiful work that you see unfolding during this three-hour work period. Um, we feel really strongly that students need a chance to eat, digest, and have a little bit of social time during the day, so we set aside 45 minutes for lunch. We call it a beautiful lunch. All of the elementary students eat lunch in their classroom, so it's a calm, quiet, peaceful time of day where they can learn social skills and take the time to really finish their food. We also then give them 45 minutes of recess time that's separate from that, so they don't have to race through their food to finish it to have time to play. And we try to get outside as many days as we possibly can. So we might only curtail recess if it's super cold or if there's thunder and lightning. But otherwise, we try to send the children outside. Um, after lunch, there's an afternoon work period. We do have some specialists in elementary. We call them workshop guides. Um, and those topics are art, music, health and wellness, and environmental education. And so about two days a week, each classroom is with one of those workshop guides learning a specialist subject. The other afternoons, the teachers might use for targeted lessons or more work time or kind of plan the different curricular areas that they're teaching. Um, and so that's kind of a summary of the elementary day. Does one of you want to talk about the analysis? Okay, Adam. I'll talk a little bit about the adolescent program, even though it'll hopefully be a while before your kids are adolescents, just so you can know where it's headed. Um, I, one of my other hats that I wear is I'm like the scheduler and registrar person of the school, so I have been building a semester two schedule for the last two weeks. Um, so adolescent schedule is divided into a block schedule, so they have A days and B days, and on those days they have four class periods of each day. So they take a total of, they have eight class periods to fill. Two of those class periods are filled with independent work time to kind of reflect what elementary does with their three-hour work period. So they have time to do independent work themselves, and we call it indie work, independent work. Um, and that's two of those eight periods. So pretty much every day a student's going to have an 80-minute period where they can work on their work. Um, then they have four core classes. We're, we're a small school. It's not huge. We're not going to offer the same amount of classes that Central can offer, but we're going to offer everything that you need and give you some option for some fun things that, you know, you can choose to do. So we have, at every grade level, there's math, there's science, there's social studies, and there's English. Uh, we offer Spanish in all of our grade levels, and so at Great River, it is a requirement for graduation to take at least two years of a foreign language to graduate. Spanish is the one we offer because as a small school, we can't really offer multiple language is, and do it well. Um, so we have Spanish and we offer it all through. Um, and students can take it in 11th and 12th grade and be very conversational and like fluent in doing composition in Spanish. Um, in 7th and 8th grade, it's pretty much similar as well. There's eight periods. They're going to fill it with occupations, which are science and science-based classes, or humanities, which is social studies and English. They have math every day. Um, and then they have, we have what's called creative expressions in seventh and eighth grade. So those are the, the culinary arts and the microeconomies. And I don't know, there's so many aquaponics. There's a variety, bike shop is another one. So there's a wide range of things that students do uh, for creative expression. And adolescent level, we have a range of arts, music, theater, um, and even math electives that students can take. We have, offer math of personal finance and math of behavioral finance. So if you're not like super into art stuff or music stuff, you can take other options. So yeah, there's a lot of course options for a small school. We do the best we can. Thank you, Karen and Stacy. Um, so 
activities. Uh, Stacy was speaking to this just a little bit, but we have activities, um, uh, athletics programs. Uh, we do ultimate basketball, soccer, volleyball, softball, track, cross country, Nordic skiing, football. List League is middle school for a number of different sports. Um, and we have a, we're in a cooperative with Twin Cities Academy in order to field enough students to have teams in all these areas. So if you're wondering how we can have a football team, for instance, when we have two students at the school who are interested in football, we're partnering with about six other schools and Twin Cities Academy is running that specifically to be able to field a team. But um, Ultimate is probably, Ultimate Frisbee is probably our biggest sport here at Great River. It's a, it's a popular one, certainly. Uh, we have a theater program, instrumental music program, choir, musical, we do two plays a year. Uh, clubs like Robotics is very big here at Great River. Um, they're here right now. My daughter's over in Robotics and I get to be here till 8.30 because that's how late it goes every, every Tuesday night. Yearbook, we have a GSA, which stands for Gender Sexuality Alliance. Uh, student governments, uh, Students Against Misogyny. We have a D&D &D club for Dungeons and Dragons fans. Um, after school activities, we have Big Canoe, Archery, Chess, Lego, Lego League. Big Canoe is our after school programming, which I won't go into great detail about. Karen can answer questions about that better than I could probably. Um, but it's our before and after school program for students um, needing care, but also involved in you know, a range of different activities and, and arts and crafts and sports and all sorts of things. So this is the very exciting portion of the presentation where I talk about how we are looked, uh, looked at, how we are sort of judged, uh, which uh, you're probably familiar with if you've been on the internet anytime recently and looking at schools. Um, we have what's called an authorizer because we are a public charter school. Um, that means we're tuition free um, and an authorizer is an organization that looks over our shoulder and checks on us and makes sure that we're doing all the things we're supposed to do, from following the state standards, to following the licensure requirements for teachers, to following all the policy uh, requirements of the state, things like that. Um, we also offer the uh, MCA test, not offer, require, because we are a uh, public school. And so in addition to teaching state standards, we do have students in third through eighth 10th and 11th, I think, right now? Ninth grade, too. Okay, taking the MCA test. Stacy is also the test coordinator in the building, so that's why I turned to her for answers. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk real briefly about these test scores now. Whatever your feelings are about standardized test scores, they are certainly a way that we are judged and looked at as a school. They are also a single data point that we can use to look at how a student is doing in a particular way, on a particular day, it, it can be valuable information for us to look at. We, on top of the MCAs, we also use the Fast Bridge test in the elementary level right now and a little bit at the adolescent level. And we use the NWIA test at the elementary, le at the adolescent level as well. So we're using some in-house tests that we use to assess how students are doing, how they're growing, and um, what they've been learning. Um, these are our MCA reading growth scores. So I threw these on here because we really like to take a look at growth. And so we've set our own goals around growth here at Great River. Um, if you look at our test scores, you can look at the data. Um, if you want more detailed information, I'll speak to this in a second. But you can look at the data on the Minnesota State Report Card. You can also look at our annual report, which has a lot of data in it. If you are a data nerd and are excited about it, like I can get sometimes. Um, you can look at the annual report on the school website and see all sorts of data. Um, this particular data is looking at, this is how we are kind of graded. Um, looking at Great River School, looking at St. Paul Public School, and looking at statewide how students are doing. Now I always say too that of course I care about students all over. I'm not trying to say look how much of a better job we're doing than these other students somewhere else. I care about all kids. and this is how we are graded as a school. And so it's important to talk about, I feel like. Um, you can see um, what we're looking at here is in the green, students who have improved, in the blue, students who have maintained, and in the pink, students whose scores have gone down. 
Um, we try to look at this longitudinally also. I didn't include that chart tonight. It, I could include charts and charts and charts, and I had to sort of draw the line somewhere. Um, what you'll see is that our reading scores are quite high, um, higher than the state and higher than the city. And also, you'll see longitudinally, if you look over the course of years, you'll see that our scores in both reading and math dropped significantly during the pandemic. That's also true of other schools around the state, around the country, I'm sure around the world. Um, and we are constantly talking about working on and trying to figure out how to support students through coming back from the pandemic. We are still in that world and still working on that on a daily basis. Um, our math scores, um, again, uh, compared to the city and the state, um, when you look at the number of students who are maintaining and improving, we like to point out that our state, more of our students are um, maintaining and improving than the city and um, similar numbers, a little bit higher maintaining at the state, but more students improving. So it gets a little, um, it gets to be a lot of data to look at and sort of absorb in any given moment. But I have a few more charts I'm gonna share with you in just a second. But I also wanted to just speak about how we're supporting all students here at Great River. So we have a student services team made up of the director of student services, deans of students. We have seven academic and behavioral interventionists and four social workers. Four social workers for 770 students is pretty remarkable compared to what you'll see at any school um, that I'm familiar with in the area. Four social workers means hopefully that they have fairly manageable caseloads and can actually serve a great number of students and get to know and build relationships with a lot of students. We have a social emotional learning coordinator, an EL coordinator, and a director of college access who does a lot of guidance counseling for the 11th and 12th graders, 12th graders in particular, as they get ready to potentially go on to college. Also, 25% of our students do identify as black, indigenous, and people of color. And so we have an equity and inclusion facilitator who's part of the leadership team, Jordan uh, Semajima. He couldn't be here tonight, but, um, and we have a BIPOC parent group that is uh, a working group of the board, so they have a voice and a place to talk to the board directly. And we have um, recently been through an equity audit, created an equity plan, and also have just completed our five-year strategic plan with four areas of improvement in it, one of them being equity. So we take it very seriously and we are constantly, we know we have areas to grow still, we know we have work to do, uh, the whole world does, and yet um, we, we are trying to actively engage in what that work is and what that looks like. Um, what you can see here, these are my last two charts that I'm gonna share in terms of test scores. This is um, a comparison of BIPOC students to white students at Great River, at the state, and at St. Paul Public Schools. So what you see in the reading proficiency for BIPOC comparison is that we have a gap. So there's a gap between our BIPOC students and our white students. Now, that gap is significantly different than the gap that we're looking at at St. Paul Public, for instance. We believe that we are doing good work for BIPOC students and that they are um, doing well here at Great River and also that we have more work to do and we have more, um, uh, we can't say that we can rest on our laurels in any sense, that we have more work to do when it comes to um, the fact that there still is a gap for us. Um, and in mathematics, there still is a gap for us, again, smaller than the state gap, smaller than the city gap. If you have questions specifically about any of that stuff, like I said, you can take a look at the data on our website, and also I'm happy to talk to you about it. I'm happy to answer questions on that front. Um, we're gonna be hanging out afterwards here as you guys get a chance to take a look at classrooms. Um, we're gonna, we'll do a Q&A, but also if you have very specific questions um, that relate to just your family, you're welcome to come and talk to me as well. Um, we do have special ed and EL programs here at Great River. We serve all students, so that means if you have an IEP or a 504, if you have a disability, um, if you need a specific accommodation, or if you are an English learning student, if your home language um, is not English, we have programs to support all of those types of students. I actually think we have a very strong special ed program here at Great River in many ways about 15, between 15 and 20% of our students have IEPs. 
Um, so a, a pretty uh, average amount of students compared to the uh, other districts and larger district in terms of the number of students here and also a very strong program um, to support those students. Many of our students who uh, have IEPs uh, have a range of uh, specific learning disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, um, have uh, anxiety disorders. Um, those are some of the really common ones, dyslexia, things along those lines, specific learning disabilities. Um, the LGBTQIA plus community um, is also very strong here at Great River. So you will see, for instance, that we have non-gendered bathrooms. You might have discovered that already if you hit up our bathrooms before the presentation started. We have non-gendered bathrooms here at Great River. Um, and uh, also we have a really strong student representation in terms of our GSA and, our, and even into our student government as well and the work that they're doing. Um, Students Against Misogyny and some of those organizations um, are uh, popular student groups here at Great River. I think personally we have a reputation, I would say we have a reputation in the community as being a safe place, as being a supportive place and uh, specifically for many different populations, but specifically for LGBTQIA plus students. Family engagement. So what do we expect of families? Um, we ask that families engage in meaningful con conversations at home. We ask that students uh, take responsibility at home. So we might ask you to cook a meal for your parents, or we might ask you to do some chores around your house as part of your homework assignments, um, homework assignments. Um, we have, uh, we ask that you hold high expectations for students as we hold high expectations for students. Um, and we ask that you ask the question, how can we be part of the solution? So when you come to us with a concern, we're trying to work together, we're trying to partner, we're trying to find solutions and move past whatever those concerns are. What we provide, what does Great River provide for families, we do parent education. Um, it's actually in our strategic plan to ramp up our parent education and to do more parent education. So having parent education nights on Montessori or teaching of math or um, trying to think of some other examples of things that we've done in the past. But um, adolescents and technology. Yeah, there's, there's been a range of different things that we've done parent education nights on. Um, but we provide uh, meaningful work for children with high expectations, systemic support for students to be challenged, and a place where you are a necessary required member of the community. I'm speaking to you parents out there specifically when I say that. We believe that you are your child's first educator. You know your child better than we will ever know your child, and we will know your child very well. Um, but we believe that um, it's a partnership between us and you are a necessary piece of that partnership. So what comes next? The enrollment process. Stacy's gonna come up and speak real quickly to what the enrollment process looks like here at Greater Lake. So if you haven't already submitted an application, you should do that. Go to greatriverschool.org slash enroll. It's a very simple application. We just need a little bit of information and then you get added to our lottery. So the lottery is gonna be on Friday, February 16th. Sometime in that morning, it's on our school calendar, which can also be found on our website. Um, the deadline to get applications in to be included in that lottery is a week prior, so February 9th. And then if any applications come in after that point, they just get added to the bottom of the waiting list at their respective grade level um, until even next year when we're still collecting applications. Because we, we take applications all year long, they just get added to the bottom of the waiting list. Um, We'll run the lottery, it'll either be in here, it'll probably be in here, it'll also be available over Zoom, um, and then what we do is the auto like random number generator, it's pretty quick, I push some buttons and populate a spreadsheet, and then you can, if you're here, you can find out where your student is on the waiting list right from the start. If you're not here, you'll have to wait uh, until we get an email out to you. It takes some time to get all that data in a way that we can email merge it to everybody. We have over a thousand applicants usually every year, so it's kind of a lot of work to get make sure everything goes out accurately. It takes a little time. So we, we say within a couple weeks of there, two to three weeks is when we'll, you'll get an email from us that says where you are on the waiting list, what the next steps are if you're getting in. Um, at that point, we'll probably, in February, by February 16th, we won't know 
who's leaving our school for next year. So I'll know we're gonna have about 63 openings in first grade. That's all I'm really gonna know. Um, so I can tell you right away, if you're, you're one to 63, you're gonna be in. If you're in uh, third grade, I don't know how many openings we're gonna have. We'll give you a waiting list number so you know where you are on that list, but we won't be able to tell you if you're gonna get in or not until we have like heard from our current families if they're going to leave or not. And I will say in grades two through six, that number is pretty low. Um, just in your mind, have that as an expectation. Two through six are not the highest entry points at Great River. Um, it is possible. We went through a lot of second graders this year um, to get fully enrolled for whatever reason. So uh, it's not impossible, but it's just more likely that you'll get in in first grade. Um, after the lottery, uh, we will hold additional info nights that'll have more information. So if you're at the top of a waiting list or you're one of those lucky people who get in in first grade, we'll have more in-depth info nights with Karen as our interim elementary program director. Um, if you're a special education family, if you just have a student with an IEP, we'll hold an extra event with our special ed leadership team. We'll talk to you more about that program. Uh, we have an info, a date set aside in April, April 26th for elementary families. If your student is getting in or is likely to get in, we will invite you to come to that event. Essentially, it's a couple hours, um, and we ask you to come in. Your student actually gets to go to a classroom and have a mini lesson with a teacher. You'll have a family meeting with an adult in our elementary as well so that we can learn more about your student um, while we do class placement stuff for the next year. And we do class placement later in the spring. Uh, so yeah, if you get in, that 26th day is gonna be pretty important. Um, and then once you're in, we have registration forms that's open in the summer. You have to fill out those forms. At the end of summer, there will be, what do we call it? I think we call it an open house meet and greet for elementary. We might have additional family meetings, but at that point, you can come in and see the classroom all set up that your student's going to be in and meet the teacher who your child will be with. And that happens right before school starts. So that's what comes next if you're lucky enough to get in. Um, you don't have to come to the lottery. It's really kind of boring, and if you end up low on the waiting list, it's really sad. Um, you're welcome to come. It's open, like it's open, it's public event, um, and it has to be, and that's fine. Um, but you know, I always hate to be the person who's like, I'm sorry, you're hundredth on the list. You know, it's not fun, and you know, it's not going to make your chances of getting getting in higher to be here. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Questions. Do we accommodate for food allergies? We do uh, as best as we can. So um, we have gluten-free options, we have vegan options, we have um, uh, a number of like uh, uh, a number of different options in the kitchen. We have had in the past students that had such specific allergies that couldn't even you know have eaten off of a surface that had cooked. Uh, uh, chickpeas in the past or something along those lines and so if, if someone's allergies are so specific we will work with your student of course but we may or may not be able to actually provide food um, so we do our best. Great question so um, in the elementary level we don't have computers in the classroom we do occasionally at upper elementary and we do testing on computers um, but the basically at elementary um, to sum it up is that we, do, we don't have screens. Uh, we don't have students interacting with screens um, whenever, uh, pretty much across the board. There are some smart boards in some of the special ed classrooms for specific special ed purposes, uh, but not in the actual classrooms. We don't have screens or smart boards in the classrooms at the elementary level. Um, at the adolescent level, there's a few, yes, there's a little more in fourth through sixth than there is in first through third where there's none. In seventh and eighth grade level, the students have uh, Chromebook carts that they use to do their work specifically to pull Chromebooks out of. And in ninth through twelfth grade, we are a one-to-one -one Chromebook program. So our ninth through twelfth grade students all get a Chromebook that they are responsible for and have to take care of. Um, and we have found actually that it decreased phone usage at the school significantly when we started doing a one-to-one -one program at the adolescent level um, because students didn't feel like, oh, I gotta look something up on my phone, I'll pull it out, oh wait, somebody texted me, well that's very exciting, I'll answer that first. They could just use their Chromebooks to do their work. But, um, but yes, less technology than you definitely see at, a, at, at some schools, for sure. So our, uh, the question is, do we do before and after care? So for our first through sixth graders, we have a program called Big Canoe, 
Um, Karen, uh, who previously ran Big Canoe, can answer all the detailed questions about it. It runs from um, 7 to 9 in the morning, 7.30. 7.45 to 9 in the morning. The times have shifted significantly, and so I'm not quite remembering them. And then from uh, 3.50 to 5, 5.45. So, um, yes, before and after school. So the question is, in the, uh, in the slide that talked about the student services department, um, are any of those staff overlapping? So a social worker and an interventionist. And no, that's four social workers doing full-time social work, seven interventionists doing full-time intervention work, um, two deans of students doing full-time dean uh, behavioral intervention work. So yes, separate staff members. Uh, yes, so the question is, is there any wiggle time in class? There is definitely wiggle time in class, both incorporated, I would say, um, in the classroom in that we have a lot of movement in our classroom, so students move around the classroom quite a bit to be doing different activities. And we also have that 45 minute recess in the middle of the day as well. So there's definitely time built in to wiggle. Sure, so uh, one of the questions was about uh, student attrition, I think, basically, like of the students that we're talking about, how many students are staying from year to year? Am I summing that up? Coming in. Do you remember the, the student, uh, the actual number exactly? I feel like it's in the like 80 and 90 percent. Like we do have a, a very high number of students that stay from year to year um, that aren't leaving. So that, yes, yes, but I can't remember the exact number. And it's 90% or above, yeah, of students that are staying from year to year. Um, and then the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Oh, sibling preference. Yes, we do have sibling preference. So uh, the lottery system is very mandated by the state and by state statutes. And so um, we are required to do the lottery in a certain way. And one of those ways is that we give sibling preference. So if you have a sibling who's in the school, you automatically move either to the open spot or to the top of the wait list. Um, and if there were three siblings, then they would go onto the wait list in the order in which their numbers are at the top, if that makes sense. We also, after siblings, we give preference to staff children as well, um, but that siblings get higher preference than that. I'd say that's that's pretty common. Yes, once one student gets in, do you want to speak to Stacy? Yeah. yeah. The answer is it depends on the grade level that they're in. So, say you get a first grader in, and that first grader happens to have a third grader and an eighth grader sibling, right? Uh, the next year, the third grader will be coming a fourth grader, they'll get into the sibling preference part of the lottery, but we may or may not have openings in fourth grade. They will be at the top of the waiting list for fourth grade, and so if there is an opening, they're going to have a greater chance of getting in. I would say that sibling who's an eighth grader moving into ninth grade is going to have an even bigger chance of getting in because we have generally have movement in ninth grade. That seems to be a point where people are like, I want to go to Central and I want like different experiences. Um, so that's a bigger point where we see movement. Um, so it just depends on the grade level. There's some grade levels where we have families that will be on the waiting list for several years with their siblings. They'll have get one kid in and then their other kids might take a while before they get in. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely more movement in the at like nine through twelve grade levels, um, and siblings get a better like there's a better chance siblings are going to get in at that age. Thank you all again for coming tonight. I hope you take the opportunity to come see the classrooms. They are very cool. Um, we won't be doing an adolescent tour this evening, but um, if you have questions about adolescent, do feel free to ask us, um, and we I can do my best to answer those as well. Thank you again.